Hello, this short video is going to walk you through the basic technique that is used to acquire and process a breast MRI scan. So what hardware do we need to uh, perform a breast MRI? You need to have a magnet that is at least 1.5T and many breast MRIs are acquired clinically on uh, 3.0Ts currently. Less than this, the resolution is insufficient. So this means that many of the open magnets can't be used for breast MRI. You should have either a dedicated breast imaging coil or a dedicated breast imaging table. These scans should not be performed using the regular chest coil that's used for other studies such as cardiac. And ideally, and certainly by ACR accreditation purposes, you should have the ability to perform an MR-guided biopsy. If you're seeing abnormalities on an MR scan, you need to be able to act on them if they're not visible by ultrasound or on uh, mammographic imaging. And if you have to refer your patients to another center that has different hardware, different technique for using the MRI scan to perform the biopsy, that is highly suboptimal. There are some very specific software requirements. You need to have software that will require, acquire multiple bilateral rapid sequence scans with a very short interval. Vibrant is um, the trademark for the GE software, but all the other major vendors have their own similar type of softwares. You need to have software to perform kinetic analysis of the contrast enhancement curves. Um, again, there's many around, such as CADStream, um, which is uh, one of the trademarks, but there are a number of different proprietary products on the market. They all have slightly different pros and cons. The radiologists not only need to be trained in interpreting the studies, but they need to be trained to um, perform MR-guided biopsies in facilities where those are available. You need to have the ability to perform sedation. Many patients are claustrophobic, and while many will do fine with some oral sedation, intravenous sedation is certainly required on occasions both for diagnostic and biopsy purposes. And the ACR has a very specific accreditation scheme for facilities and the radiologists who work there in terms of the hardware, software, and the training that those radiologists have received. Breast MRs are acquired prone. Most commonly they're acquired in the axial and or sagittal um, planes. Uh, some facilities, for reasons of their software limitations, acquire them in the coronal planes. It was a little more challenging to interpret it. And images are attained both before and after the administration of intravenous gadolinium. Some means of suppressing the fat is key. We need to see areas of an gadolinium enhancement in the breast as contrasted to the normal breast fat. This can be through some type of a spectral fat suppression technique or through obtaining subtraction images or more commonly through both. My personal bias is that you need to have the soft and hardware in it to enable you to do good fat suppression as if you have to rely solely on the subtraction images. There are some inherent problems with artifact and patient movement that in some cases may limit it. And looking at non-suppressed images are extremely challenging for seeing small areas of focal enhancement. Here is one example of a typical breast coil. So the patient will lie along here, her face is uh, lying here, it's as if she's on a massage table, and her breasts are dependent within um, the holes when the coils are built into the hardware surrounding the breasts here. This coil fits on top of the usual MR table, and the limitations of a separate coil such as this is you are limited to the patient size. You need a certain distance between her um, back and the top of the magnet here, they shouldn't be touching. We found that this effectively limited our patient size to around 220 pounds. Um, the size of breasts that will also fit into these coils is pretty much limited to about a double D, um, possibly an E cup, but not larger than that before you start getting significant artifact. There are a number of different dedicated breast imaging tables available on the market. This is um, one which is uh, marketed by Sentinel and on this particular table, the brass will come through and have coils set here. And as you can see, there's a lot of space under here. It's the, the patient is um, at the same level as the regular table here. So we can fit much bigger patients in and there really is no uh, practical limitation on breast size using a dedicated 
table. This table is just wheeled in and out. Um, when patients have biopsy on this table, you can just wheel them straight out and into another room um, for recovery, for example. You want to obtain all of the imaging within about five to seven minutes after the injection of contrast, because after that, the gadolinium diffuses into normal tissues and it's going to obscure the abnormality. There needs to be a certain temporal resolution. As I said, we're going to obtain multiple scans after the injection of contrast, but you need each scan to be completed under about 90 seconds. You need to obtain a gadolinium sensitive T1 weighted sequence such as SBGR. As I said, you need to be able to provide some form of a fat and suppression technique on this ideally with section um, thickness, certainly no more than three millimeters and really something nearer to two is ideal. You must be able to cover the complete breast and axilla, and this requires some training, often on the part of the technologists. Um, these MR technologists are not used to positioning breasts in the same way as MR as our mammotechs, um, and we get a mammotechs to train the MR techs to be able to get the breast down into the coil. That we're seeing all of the breast, we're seeing up into the axilla, um, which is sometimes a challenge with larger breasts. And the fat suppression should be very homogeneous, otherwise it's going to be difficult to see those areas of contrast enhancement. Pulsations of the heart are going to produce a motion artifact, and this is going to be in the phase direction. So therefore, we orientate our frequency encoding direction in the AP direction so that that motion artifact goes from side to side in the chest and not through the breasts. Listed here is the current basic protocol that we're using at um, Dartmouth-Hitchcock. It has a little variation depending on which scanner we're using. But basically it's going to include an axial localizer, axial T2, which are going to be with um, fat suppression, which are either going to be unilateral or bilateral depending on which scanner we're using. Ideal is bilateral, but we have some technical limitations on one of our scanners. You then want to have a axial T1 weighted image without fat suppression, followed by a T1 weighted axial image with fat suppression, and that's our baseline before contrast. After injection of gadolinium, we're going to acquire four to five scans approximately 40 seconds after the injection of gadolinium and completing all these scans, as I said, within that sort of five to seven minute period. With our current protocol, we end by obtaining a sagittal sequence, again with fat suppression, and this is, note, the very last sequence is right at the end when there is some diffusion into normal tissues. And then we get a series of subtractions of the gadolinium enhanced minus the non-enhanced, so that's sequence four, the series of sequence fives minus four here. Um, so we will end up with four or five subtractions as well. So let's just run through each of these sequences. Here's a unilateral T2 with fat suppression of the left breast. And here we're seeing a cyst as bright on T2. Seromas are also going to be bright. Fibrocystic disease has increased signal. Lymph nodes may be very bright, so we'll talk about in another talk. And some tumors may have higher T2 signal um, than others, but they're generally not very bright. Here is the T1 non-fat saturated sequence, axial plane again. These are useful for looking out for fat necrosis. They're useful for looking for fat in the hyla of lymph nodes and also for looking for architectural distortion or, or mass effect. Our T1 fat saturated sequence is going to be the baseline that we'll later compare the gadolinium enhanced sequences to. And then our four or five sequential T1 fat saturated gadolinium enhanced sequence looking for areas of enhancement and to provide the basic data for our kinetic curves. Just notice here in this patient, you can see an enhancing spiculated mass in the deep posterior tissue of the left breast. So in our institution, the last sequence we obtained is the sagittal sequence. By this time, there's often significant background enhancement and malignancies in which the contrast tends to wash out on the later studies may not be very apparent on the sagittal sequence. Conversely, benign processes, which tend to have washing in of contrast or progressive enhancement, may become more apparent on this sequence. So here's our sagittal sequence in this patient. 
Here's that spiculated mass in the inferior aspect of her left breast. And the T1 sagittal delayed image is uh, very helpful for localizing lesions, giving another um, dimension to the size estimation and showing areas of delayed enhancement as I described just now. We will obtain subtraction sequences for every gadolinium sequence, so four, we'll end up with four or five of these. Well, the one that we focus on is the one that is obtained from the gadolinium enhanced sequence at the point of peak enhancement. So that's usually the first one, but occasionally it is the second one. These increase our sensitivity for detecting lesions. They are unfortunately very sensitive to patients moving between the, the um, pre-gadolinium and post-gadolinium images, although the CAD software does do a pretty good motion correction in many cases. By removing baseline high signal areas from the pre-contrast images, such as proteinaceous cysts and hematomas, we're going to get rid of a lot of that background stuff. But note that we should always see that vessels and the heart, etc., are enhanced, and we can use this to judge whether an adequate contrast bolus has been injected. So here is a um, typical subtraction sequence. This is gadolinium minus the pre-gadolinium image. Um, this is the peak enhancement subtraction. And you can see here that speculated mass that we saw previously is really jumping out with very little background enhancement. 3D MIP reconstructions are extremely helpful. This is of a different patient here. And you can see that these bilateral breast masses really jump out on the image compared to the background diffuse enhancement in the right breast in this patient and also the blood vessels. And these are obviously 3D and we can rotate them as uh, we wish. Finally, we will perform computer-aided analysis. This is really computer-aided analysis rather than detection, although they're all called CAD. Um, and by using a variety of softwares that are out there, these will perform a motion correction, extremely useful for the subtraction images. It will identify the scan that contains the peak of the contrast bolus and then analyze the kinetic curve of how that bolus goes into the breast tissue and out of the breast tissue on a voxel by voxel basis. What it's basically then doing is taking a series of thousands of kinetic analysis curves and put, turning them into a graphical display. So each voxel has its own individual enhancement curve within the 3D volume of the breast. These can be displayed in a variety of different ways depending on your particular vendor. Um, so here we have the 3D MIP of the subtraction image with the color overlay displayed on top of it. And here in a different patient we have the cover, color overlay on the left displayed on the 3D MIP and then on the right here it's displayed as, uh, on a single slice of the subtraction image and you can overlay it usually on top of any specific image. So the CAD software will color code each voxel dependent on the kinetic curve of the tracer going in to the breast and then as it uh, the sequential scans follow as it may come out of the breast. So for example here we have in this particular patient here's their baseline study and then we have um, three subsequent scans most patients will have four or five. Here is the time that's taken as the point of peak enhancement which is scan number one in a patient who has a progressive curve, the contrast goes into the breast at the time of the first scan and then continues up at the time of subsequent scans. In a patient who has plateau type enhancement, the contrast goes into the breast and then it continues approximately the same level and a washout curve, it comes into the breast and then it washes out. And how much washes out is usually counted as being more than 10% of the peak level by the time of the last scan. Different software parameters can be set, such that your threshold may be that it has to enhance more than 50% from baseline level, or that it needs to enhance more than 100% baseline level. And where that threshold is set is going to affect how sensitive your study is to small degrees of enhancement, which can be a good or bad thing depending how much background enhancement there is. 
Unfortunately, if only diagnosing cancer was as easy as just seeing the red spots on a breast MR scan. Um, there are a number of problems with CAD. One is patient movement if it can't be adequately corrected for by the software. Movement can make a lot of artifactual colour on the scan. Bad things, i.e. malignant processes, may have relatively benign curves and uh, give you false reassurance that they're nothing to worry about. DCIS, particularly low-grade, low-grade cancers, invasive lobular cancer and partially treated breast cancer are some examples. Conversely, benign processes can have washout or malignant type curves, such as normal lymph nodes commonly have washout curves, tiny foci of fibrocystic disease or papillomas. That's the end of this uh, short lecture. We'll be talking more about the common appearances of abnormalities on uh, one of the further lectures. Thank you for listening.